So it's 8 o'clock, it's time to, to start our, our lecture for today. And as I mentioned in our first class, half of the, of the course will be devoted to learning some analytical models to, for manufacturing systems. And the other half is going to be learning how to use simulation models to uh, study and solve uh, manufacturing problems. So today we're going to start with the modeling portion of the class and we're going to be focusing on learning a discrete event simulation software package that is called Simon Arena and before we get started with that specific software I want to let you know that this is not the only software that is created to model manufacturing systems there are other options there are other options um, such as Simio is another package that we have available in our computers. There's another one called Witness, which is also available. Um, but every professor will have a preference in terms of the software package that they, they like to use. In, in my case, uh, I prefer Arena because in terms of modeling uh, manufacturing systems, I, I think it gives you a lot of flexibility. Um, so we're going to focus on that one, but everything that you're going to learn here in terms of ARENA can be applied to these other two software packages, okay? So, um, so that's the idea. So once you learn one, you can easily transition to, to the other uh, with the concepts that you're going to be learning here. Okay, so I prepared some slides to guide us for this first lab and these are available on tracks. So this is what we're gonna use to, to guide the, the lecture today. And once we go through the basic concepts that I'm going to explain today, then I'm gonna show you how to build a simulation model. And you're gonna go step by step with me in building that uh, example and then I'm going to ask you to work on, on a practice problem, which is a lab that you're going to be working on your own to try to apply the concept that we learned in class today. Okay? And depending how much time we have left today to work on the lab, uh, I decided to give you until tomorrow afternoon to, to work on the example and to upload the file to, um, to tracks. Um, something that I want to show you also is that you can get a student version of the software online. So if you go to your track site, I put a link here. There you can go and you can register to download the, the trial version of the software. This should be enough for the type of exercise that we are going to be doing in class. Okay, so if you want to download it, working ho at home with the, with the lab and then upload it, that's fine too. Um, for the project, you most likely are going to need the professional ver version, uh, depending on, 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 the, on the problem that you're looking at. And for those, you have to come here to the university. The difference between the trial version and the professional version is that the professional version allows you to build bigger models. The, Prior version will allow you to use only 200 blocks, whereas the professional version just has no limits. But again, for the purpose of the lab exercises, we are not going to go above that number of blocks, so the trial version will be enough. So I encourage you, if you have access to a computer and you want to um, have the, the software with you, you can download it on online. Okay, so. Now, before we get started, I want, I'm going to be using some terms, some terminology here um, when I'm discussing the, the use of the software. And here are the, the most useful terminology in terms of simulation. Uh, the first one is called an entity, and this is the object of interest. So if you're trying to model a manufacturing plan, most likely you are going to be interested in the behavior of the product. So how the product travels around the manufacturing system, how many units of that products are you producing, 
how many are defective ones and so on. So an entity is basically that object that is going to be moving uh, around the system. Okay? An attribute is a property of an entity. So if you think about product, you can think about the size of the product. That could be a big box or a small box. That could be a property of the entity. It could be the color. It could be the processing time. Maybe this unit requires to be processed in this drill machine for 10 minutes, but this other unit only requires 5 minutes. So that's the characteristic of the entity. So that's what we're going to call an attribute. It's anything, a property, something that you can assign to the entity that is going to be part of the entity when it's moving throughout the system. Model, we discussed the model already. It's an abstract representation of the system which is what we're going to try to do with the simulation model. We're going to try to build a representation of the actual system in a computer. The system state is the collection of variables that contains all the information necessary to describe the system at any time. So system state, you can look at this as, let's say your system is just one machine that processes products or process, let's say, um, a circuit boards. So your, let's say this is an oven, that you have to pass the circuit board to get the, the parts glue. So the system say basically is going to be defined on the state of the machine. So let's say the machine is busy right now um, processing a the part, then the system state is going to be the machine is busy. But if there's no units uh, being processed at that time, then the system state is going to be the machine is idle. So it's going to be based on the status of the model that you're trying to uh, represent. An event is an instantaneous occurrence that changes the state of the system. So going back to the same example, if you have an oven and the oven is idle, a entity or a part arrives to the oven, automatically the state of the oven is going to be changed to be, be busy. So that's what's gonna cause the change on the state is what we call an event. So the arrival of that part into the oven is the event that causes the change on the state of the system. Um, and an event list or future list of events record of an event to occur now or in the future. So again, when we try to represent a system, we're going to have to have any some type of information about what is the future demand in terms of what are the arrivals that you're expecting in your system. So uh, most of the time what we do is we go observe the real system and we come up with certain type of probability distribution that is going to be modeling what we predict is going to happen in the future. So for example, if you're looking at a production uh, setting, you want to know how many parts you're going to be processing next week. And you know, maybe I'm going to have 10 orders for this customer. And that will require me to have a production of uh, 10 units per order. So based on that, you will say, OK, so I'm going to be producing 20 parts a day uh, in order to fulfill this order in a week. OK, so those events are going to be predicted. But you know that you need to have those events in order to complete the, the, the order. OK, and, and you will see this in. We'll understand this better when we start doing the modeling in, in, in Arena. And then we have a clock. Again, this is going to be representing the real system. So we're going to be using time. Say we're going to be modeling a week. Then we're going to have a clock representing every day, every hour, every minute in our uh, simulation. And finally, I have here what we call a variable. Um, this is something that we use to most of the time to collect information from the system. So information representing some system characteristics. For example, if you want to know how many units you have in your system, what we call walk in, work in process, how many units are currently being processed inside your system, you can use a variable to represent the time that the unit enters. And then when it's completed, you decrease that same variable by one, and it's going to be a, a unit that is completed. But that difference in time, 
and also the difference in the record of the variable will tell you how many units are, how many units are processed right now. And again, these are things that we are going to be using and learning throughout uh, our examples and uh, our lectures. But I just wanted to give you an idea of this concept because we're going to be using them uh, frequently in class. Any questions? Okay. Okay, so I want you to log in into the computers and we're going to start working in the, in the example that I mentioned earlier. So the first thing I want you to do is to create a folder in which you're going to be saving all these examples and your, your work. The reason I'm forcing you to do this is because based on my experience, students forget to save the models and then suddenly the computer stops working and they miss all the work and they have to start over again. So in order to avoid that, I would always recommend you that you go and the first thing you do is once you open the file, you save it and you continuously save your model uh, when you're working. So this could be um, your home directory, your desktop, anywhere that you can find the information that you're going to be storing for, for the purpose of the class. Again, you're going to be uploading this information into track, so it's very important that you, you save in um, this, this labs. Um, so once you, you have created that directory, we can open Arena from the star menu. So let me show you where you can find that. So if you go to star and programs, there's going to be a folder called Rockwell Software. That's the folder that you want to open. And inside that, there's going to be another folder called Arena. And that's the, the software that we are looking for. Okay, so inside Rockwell Software, inside Arena, uh, you'll find Arena. There's another uh, group of so software here. We're going to be using those also throughout the semester, the input analyzer, the output analyzer, and probably the process analyzer. But for now, we're going to uh, start with the, the actual software, which is called Arena. And if you open that, you will see something like this. Um, so there's a couple of things that we can highlight here. Uh, first, you have your options at the top, like any other software. Um, but the window that you see to your left are the blocks that we are going to be using to build our models. Okay, this is what we, the, the area in which we are going to build the model, and this area right here is basically to see the output or see the, the processing of your simulation when we start running the, the, the actual model. But for now, that's all you need to know. Um, let's, we're going to get back to this in a second. Um, okay, so here are the instructions. Actually, this is the first thing that I want you to do when you start building your simulation model. So that's why I asked you to, to create a, uh, a directory for you to save your model. And I want you to use this um, strategy to save your model. So I want to see your last name, the number, first you put the last number, and then your last name. So I can keep track of the models that you're submitting throughout the semester. So when you come here, You go to File, Save As, and I'm going to put it in my desktop. I'm going to save this as Lab 1, and then my last name. You can use capital letter or lower letter, and then Save. And it's very simple it's instructions, but they help me a lot when I start grading these um, models. Okay, 
Um, so there's a, one of the options that you have here on the top, top toolbar. You can go to run, which is this tab right here, and set up. And you can specify in this tab right here, project parameters, the project title, the analyst name, and the project description. Um, first, well, since the first thing that we are going to do is the, the example, I'm going to put here example one. Um, the analyst name, Perez. And then uh, for now, I want you to uncheck all these options. This is basically telling the software what type of statistics you want to collect from your model. We're going to get back to this later, but for now, please uncheck them um, so we don't get those reported right away. Um, and once you do that, you can hit apply. The second thing I want you to do is to go to reports and choose from this list the last one that is called Simon Summary. That is the report that I want you to use for reporting the statistics. Okay, so Simon Summary Report. It's going to be a notepad file that is going to be generated once you are done running your, your simulation. Okay, so after that you can click OK and then you're going to be done. Any questions? Those instructions are the ones that are listed here. There's some additional things that we, we are going to do later, like the replication parameters. This is going to be based on the model that you're going to be building. So for example, um, replication is basically the number of times that you want to repeat the experiment. So, for example, I'm running this simulation model. I'm using probability distributions to describe the, the performance and the behavior of the system. But each probability distribution will have a random number generator. And if you're familiar with probability statistics, that is basically how the system is going to represent randomness. So a random number generator is going to use a probability distribution to generate some type of um, processing time or arrival time for the entities in your system. So if you run this just one time, you run only one experiment, you're going to get a result. But if you run the experiment twice, let's say representing a different day, when you run that same model, you should get a different result because you're using a different seed to generate different randomness in your system. So replication parameters basically say how many times you want to run this experiment. Do you want to run this 10 times? You're going to have 10 different replications, 10 different experiments, and each will provide you with a different result. The numbers that you're going to get are close, okay? because again, you're using the same system. But since there's some um, variability involved in this probability distribution, they're not going to be the same. That is going to be very important, and I'm going to get back to that in a, in a, at a certain point when, when we are working on the labs. But for now, that's all you need to know. Okay? You're going to have the number of times that you want to repeat the experiment is basically the number of times that you want to repeat the, the modeling of your system. And uh, the, the software allows you to, to tell you, okay, how many times you want to run this. One, two, ten, a hundred depending on the number of experiments that you would need. Um, the, the other thing here is when you, you can select whether to run the model using um, Batron or not Batron, meaning that these simulation models that you are going to create can be animated. You can represent the behavior of the system by creating an animation module. Like if you have boxes, you can represent those boxes and those boxes are going to be moving. 
you can represent a machine. The machine is going to be moving and changing states uh, if you generate an animation for your system, okay? But what happens is when you run the model with the animation, it takes longer for, for it to give you the results. If you choose not to run the animation, the results are going to be provided very fast because you don't have to show everything that's happening in your system with the animation. So we have the option to select whether you want to use the animation or not. And that is what is listed at the end of this slide. So to show you how to uh, perform those two instructions, uh, for the replication, you can go here to run, setup, and replication parameters is the, the tab that you want to use. And here at the top, it tells you how many replications, how many times you want to run this experiment. For now, we're going to use one. Um, there's other parameters here, replication length, how many, how long is the simulation um, last. So if you want to run this for eight hours, then you put here eight, and you're going to keep this at hours as your time units. Um, if you are running at the system that is always open, like uh, Walmart or something like that, you can put 24 hours here, but if a system that lasts eight hours, you can change this to eight hours, depending on how many hours per day you want to model. And we also have an option for terminating condition. For now, you don't have to worry about this, and also the warm-up period that is coming to come later. Um, and one very important thing is this one, that is called baseline units. That one is important because when you start inputting the information into your model, you need to be consistent in terms of the time units that you are using. So if you are going to be representing a processing time and the information that you have is in minutes, then you're going to input the information in minutes. But if you tell the system that your base time units is hours, what this is going to do is it's going to think that those 10 units are 10 hours instead of 10 minutes. So one important thing is you are always consistent with the time units that you are using in your model. So if you're going to be using minutes, it's minutes for all the input information that you're using. But the second thing is you have to let the software know that the units that you're using are minutes. Okay? So from here, we can start talking about some of the blocks that we are going to use. And we're going to start with the basic stuff. Um, you are going to be representing only one resource, which is going to be a machine. And we are going to be counting the number of units that are processed based on the performance of that machine. And that's going to be our first example. Um, so in order to build such type of model, we need some type, uh, certain types of blocks. And the, the way that I uh, designed these lectures is that we are going to start with the basic blocks that were designed for Arena. These are called Simon blocks. The reason that I do that is because if you understand how these blocks work, then it's easier to transition to the latest blocks that are called the arena blocks. So for now, they're, they're very similar, but this gives you a better understanding of how, what is behind the constructions of the blocks, the latest blocks. Okay, so the first two labs are going to be using this Simon blocks, and you will see that once you understand this block, it's very easy to transition to the latest one. Okay, so the first thing that we're going to do is to define what I call a, our experimental frame. An experimental frame is basically establishing all the things that you're going to need to run your, your experiment. In this case, we're going to have a machine. We are going to need to count the number of parts. Uh, we need to specify how long the, the model is going to be running, and so on. All those things are going to be part of our experiment, our experimental frame, okay? And we need to define those. So in order to define our resources, we need to use a resource element called uh, resources. Uh, 
So the resources element defines the characteristics of the resources, including the resource names and the initial capacities. Uh, the capacity represents the number of identical units of resource uh, of a resource that is available. So if you have only one machine, the capacity is going to be one. But if you have two identical machines, then you're going to have two machines. That's very simple. Um, and that's what we're going to do uh, in order to define our resource. Okay, so before I continue, let me go back here. Sorry. Because when you open the software, you are not going to be seeing the block that you're going to need, by the way. Okay, so I need to teach you how to find those blocks. You're going to come here to this window, the basic uh, process window. And you're going to right click there and you're going to select tempo, template, template panel and then click attach. If you get to a specific folder that shows you a list of blocks, then you're fine. If not, I'm going to teach you how to get there. So you're going to go to computer, C drive, let's see, if I remember where the Rockwell software is, program, files. Program files, 86. Here's the Rockware software. Arena template. And then you should see this list of TPO files. Anybody was able to find those? Okay. So we are going to choose blocks and elements. Those are the two templates that we need. So we can add those two. And as I was explaining here, we are using the resources element, so we're going to use the element list to find this block, the resources. So if you go to this list, you'll find resources here. And you're going to add that here. So you're going to just drag that block into your uh, main window. And in order for you to keep track of what you're trying to do, um, if you go here to this option, the one that says text, if you click there, <clears throat> I'm gonna type here experimental frame. Just to keep that information under that because the blocks that we are going to be defining here are not the model are just related to our experiment the model is going to be defined over that okay so resources so now we move to the use of the blocks to build the model, okay? And again, what we're trying to do today is to represent a simple resource, let's say a machine. Okay, so there's uh, going to be a group of blocks that we are going to need to represent such type of resource. Um, the first one is called seeds. And these use a resource and remove it from the list of available resources. So Basically, what this blog is going to do is going to check if, this, if the resource that you need is available. So 
So if it is busy, it's going to put a request and it's going to wait until the, the resource become available. It's going to seize the, the resource once it become available and it's going to use it with the current entity. Okay, so the seize block, <coughs> use a resource and remove it from the list of available resources. For example, a capter use a hammer. The hammer is no longer available until the capter is finished with. In that time, in that moment, the, the hammer becomes available. Then we have the de delay block. So once you seize the, the, the resource, then for how long are you going to seize that resource? For how long you're going to keep that resource busy? That's what we use here. The delay block represents a delay caused by some factor. For example, worker goes on a break for 30 minutes. It's a 30 minute delay process. So the resource is not going to be available during that time. Any questions? And then once you're done with your time, you release the resource. Okay, so return a resource to the resource pool, meaning that the resource become available. For example, the carpenter has finished using the hammer and you return it to the toolbox, someone else can use the hammer, can seize the hammer and use it and then release it. So that's the three step logic that you're going to be using. You're gonna seize the resource, you're gonna delay the resource and then you're gonna release it um, after you are done. Okay, so, in order to represent a resource, basically what we are saying is you're going to need three blocks. So if you go to the block window here, you need a seize block, you need a delay block, and you need a release block. And you see how these blocks are connected? So sometimes the, the software is going to connect them automatically, sometimes it would not. So I'm going to show you how to connect them when that's not the case. But if we want to represent a resource, we need to have those three things. A cease, a delay, and a release. Okay, any questions? Are you able to see this window or do you want me to increase the size? Okay. Okay. So that's about it. That's all we're going to be needing today. Um, but before we get into the exercise, I want to show you how to collect some statistics. And for today, what we are going to need is just to count how many units are processed. Okay? So, in order to have such type of counter, we need to define two blocks. One in the element, or the experimental frame, and one related to the model. Okay, so for the elements, we have a block that is called counters, and the counters element specifies the parameters for counters that may be used to keep integer count statistics on events occurring in the model. So every time an entity crosses this block, you're going to increase your counter number. If you're increasing that by one unit, it's going to increment by one unit. If you're increasing that by two units, then it's going to increase by two units. Okay, so this is going to be the block in the experimental frame. You're going to define the name, and every time a unit crosses, you need to specify how many, how much you're going to increase your counter. It's going to be one, that's the default, but if you want to increase it by two, then you have to change that in the experimental frame. The count block is the one that is going to be part of the model. So the count block increments the counter specified by the counter ID by the value of the operand counter increment. And what we are interested in is to uh, count the number of unit processes. Okay, so going back to the model, Basically, what we are saying is, I'm going to have the counter, so I need an element for counters here. And I'm going to put a block also in my model, 
that is the one that is going to count the unit. So if I go here, I choose the count block, and then I'm going to put it after the release block. Because once the unit is processed, then I can't count it because it's processed. So now you see that the, the two blocks are not connected. So I need to connect those two. There is an option here, if you see this connect icon, if you click on that, you will be able to connect those two blocks. See that? The, this icon here, if you click there, it will allow you to connect those two blocks. Okay, so in general, this is your, what you're going to need to build the example for today's lab. We need to add some other um, blocks here, but these are the most important ones. Um, so, and we also need to fill the information that we need, but in order to, to fill out the information, we need to see the, the example information. So, any questions so far? No? Good. So. If we go back here, this is going to be the example. This is what we are going to be using as an example before we get to work into the lab. So what we have here is a drilling machine that is going to be processing parts. Those parts are arriving. There's a queue in front of the machine. The machine has this processing time. The processing time is given in minutes and it's following a triangular distribution. So I'm assuming that you're familiar with probability distributions at this point. But for now, um, that's all you need to know. So this is the processing time. This is coming by observing the system, taking um, time observations, and then based on those observations, we are generating this probability distribution. And then we have the interarrival times, meaning that each part you're going to have an arrival of a part separated every four minutes, about 4.4 minutes. You're going to have a new arrival coming into your queue. And this is following an exponential distribution. So with this variability in terms of the arrivals and this variability in terms of the processing time, we want to know how many units are producing eight hours. And that's what we want to do for the example. And I'm going to guide you by building this. But by following this, you, sh you should be able to do the lab that is on track, okay? So let's get started. So now I have more information about the system and what, what I want to achieve. So some of the things that you need to add to your current um, model window is the arrivals of the, of the parts. How are you going to be generating these parts? For that, we use what is known as a create block. So the create block is this one under the count block. And you will put that in front of your model. And if you double click on that one, there's going to be a lot of options here. But what we are interested now is in defining the inter interval, which is meaning how much time is going to be between arrivals. So every 4.4 minutes, a, an arrival is going to happen. So instead of typing the actual distribution into this block, I would recommend you to do the following. So you go to interval, you click there, and you do a right click, and you can show build expression. This is going to show this window. What we are going to be using to define these intervals are the random distributions. So if you open that into your menu, it is going to show the different options in terms of the probability distributions that are available. Okay? 
And remember, I'm recording this lecture for your reference, so you're going to have access to this video um, in case you're, you're needing to. So for the purpose of this, what type of distribution we are going to be using? The exponential, right? So I'm going to click the exponential. And this is going to give you a mean here to your right. So the mean that we are going to be using is 4.4. Okay, so that's it's coming from this information. So what we want is expo 4.4. You can type in this directly into your interval, or you can use the build expression option to do the same thing. So this is an expo 4.4. We click OK and then we click OK. So that is what we need, an exponential 4.4 in the interval uh, space. Any questions? Okay. So we defined our arrivals. Now, um, if you look at the model before the machine here, we have a cube. Most of the time when you have a resource, you need to model also the queue that is in front of that resource. Okay? And we also have a, uh, a block that we can use to represent that. But in order to define our queue, we also need to define it in our experimental frame. So we're going to go back to the elements uh, window and we're going to find the queue's experimental frame or the Q's elements block. And that is going to be tied to our Q block. Okay, so first you define the element, or you use the element block, and then you put the block on top in your model. So going back to the block template, I have the Q somewhere here. Okay, so I can put that in front of, of my resource. And we are almost there. And now I can start defining all the, all the information that I need for my model. Okay, so I'm going to start by defining the queue. I need to provide a name for that queue in my experimental frame. So if you go to the queues block, element block, you can double click on that one and it's going to tell it's going to ask you okay how many queues do you have or do you have any queues yes you're going to add one and the name is going to be typed here so i'm going to you can name this anywhere you want or how you want it i'm going to put just q1 and and this is the elements queue, remember, the elements block. You can tell what type of queue you're going to have. Basically, what type of rule are you going to follow. If it is first in, first out. If it is last in, first out. You have multiple options here. But most of the time, you want to choose the first one in the, in the queue to go to the machine. But there, there are other options depending on the type of model that you are going to use. And that's all you need to do for the purpose of defining the experimental frame. So we name the queue. Now I want also to name my resource. So for that, you need to double click here, the resource. You're gonna add how many resources you want. Well, we're gonna have one machine. So when you click add, these are all the options that we have for the resource. For now, I just want you to type a name for your resource. It's going to be machine one. Um, you can specify how are you going to manage that machine. If it's going to be capacity based, how many machines you're going to have. Um, you can also have a schedule saying that the machine is going to work only certain hours of the day. 
but that we're going to get that to that in the, in the future. Uh, but for now, that's all you need to do here. Just define a name for for the machine. Machine one. And since in the in the exercise, it's asking us how many units are produced. We're going to use a counter block to count those units. So we also need to define a name for that counter. So that's why we have this counters element block here. So we're going to add that. And I'm going to name this number of units. Or you can name it. I mean, you can give your own name to this counter. Anything that will remind you that that's the name of the counter. OK, and then click OK. So all the things that we need to define our model are already defined. Now I'm going to use that information to build my model. So I have the create block. I have my queue block. So if you click on the queue, it's going to ask you for a queue ID. If you open here, the name that you give to the queue is showing up now in the model block. Okay, so you can select that block and then click. Well, before we get into the next thing, so that's all you need for the example. You put the queue ID there which is the same name that you have used here in the elements block. Then we are going to connect that block to the create block. And then we are also going to connect this block to the sys block. Now we want to seize a resource. So if you double click here, you'll see this window. You're going to add a resource to these sys block and that's going to be the resource that you define in your resources element. So the good thing about defining everything at the, at the experimental frame is that when you get to build the model everything is listed so you just have to choose what you need. Okay so you're gonna um, seize this machine Okay. Then the delay block is basically the, the duration of the processing time and that is provided here. It follows a triangular distribution. So you can use the build expression for that or you just you can also copy this expression and paste that same thing here. And that should also work. So it's a triangular 3.2, 4.2, and 5.2. Any questions so far? And then click OK. And then you, once you're done with the processing time, you're going to release that same resource that you see. So on the release block, you're going to add the resource ID, which is the same machine that you seize at the beginning of the process. And then click OK. And then after the, the machine processes the unit, you want to count how many units were processed. So you have the counter block here. You can double click on that one and you can choose the counter ID, which is the one that we define in the experimental frame. Okay. And once you are done with representing the system that you want to model, you need to add a block that is called dispose. That basically what it does is it destroys the entity that were generated so it gives you some extra memory space in your computer. So if you no longer need the entity, you can dispose it 
and it will destroy that empty saving some space for your computer processing time. Okay, so the comp block is going to be connected to that dispose block. And you can save what you have. Do you have any questions at this point? Okay, so one way to check if your model is correct is to go to run, check model, or to heat F F4. It's the same thing. And the system is going to let you know if you have any warnings or errors in your model. So if the, everything is okay, you should get this message, no errors or warning in your model. If you have any errors, please let me know and I can help you find what the error is. Yes. One second. Yes. Yes. Let's go ahead. Let's do that. So now we can go to the run setup module. We're going to run this only for one replication. The replication length is going to be eight hours. And the processing times and the arrival times that I gave you in the examples are in minutes. So now you need to change the base time units to minutes. Okay? And then we can click apply and okay. And in order to run this simulation you can go here to the go icon which is the play button here and it will run really fast and if you want to see the results it's giving you the number of units and the total we should all have the same result other than five you can stop that yeah sometimes it will not work and then you can okay so it's going to we're gonna change that to eight hours and then apply yeah if you don't change the the region it will go to an infinite so you should get 105 good okay so that's all you need to work on the lab for today let me show you what the lab is all about and again, you're not going to have enough time to work in the lab and finish it in the period of, of the lecture time. Um, I decided to give you until 5 p.m., but I think I'm going to give you until Tuesday to finish it in case you have any questions. So I'm going to change the submission on tracks to uh, Tuesday, 11 o'clock, which is our um, lecture time for next week. 8 o'clock, I'm sorry. Um, so is that okay? So, um, so let me show you the lab exercise. Okay, so on Tuesday you're going to submit this Right, uh, this document to me and you're also gonna have to upload this to, to track by Tuesday at 8 o'clock so the exercise basically you are a consultant specializing in simulation a lot of machine shop has asked you to, uh, for your company to ask at its current operation the machine shop performs three activities really meaning and writing job are started in the shop by a drilling operation. The shop has two drills and the queue in front of the drill can hold no more than two jobs. The shop has three mills, milling machines, and the milling queue can hold up to three jobs. And there are two grinders and the grinding queue can hold up to um, no more than two jobs. And under here, 
showing you the you see instead of having only one machine now you have three and those are in sequence so you finish with one then the unit go to the next one the unit goes to the next one okay so by looking at the system we finished um, we decided to have an exponential distribution with an interval time of five minutes. So the units are gonna come here using an exponential distribution with five minutes. And then the processing time for drilling machines are given here. They follow a unit one, six, nine in minutes. A mill follows the triangular and the grinder follows the discrete um, distribution. So there are certain things here that I need to explain before you are able to finish this. But what I want you to see is, this is a report that I want you to submit, how many jobs are completed in 40 hours, the utilization rate of each resource, and the total number of jobs ejected due to full queues. Okay, so let's talk about some of the things that you need to know for working this. Okay, so first, how can you specify a different number of machines? Well, because for example, for the drilling machine, we're gonna have two instead of just one. So if in the example that we did in class, we have only one machine, right? But we can change that to two by changing the capacity of the machine from one to two. So now instead of having only one machine, I'm gonna have the same queue, but that queue is gonna go to two different machines. So what basically what I'm showing here by just changing that number is that this queue with one machine now have a queue with two machines. So it can go to the first machine that is available. Okay? Just by changing that to two. And that's what you're going to need for your model. So if I run the same example now, by making that change, what you should expect? You should see more or less part process. I cannot hear you. More, right? Because you have more capacity. So you're gonna have the same units coming in, but you can process more units. So if I run this, hmm. Interesting. So now instead of 105, we only have 96. Why is that? I'll let you think about that, but that's essentially what you need to do to change the capacity from one to two. Now, you don't want to go here and change this to two, because what that's going to do is instead of ceasing one entity, it's going to cease two, and that's not what you want. What you want is just change the capacity of the machines here. So the capacity from one to two. Now the other thing is in terms of the queues there's a, a restriction here saying that you can hold up to two jobs at a time. 
So that means that you cannot have more than two units in your queue. So for example here, if I want to have only two units in my queue, for the example, I can change the the name of the queue will remain the same, but I can change the capacity of the queue here in the block. So if it is two, I can say I cannot hold more than two units in my queue. What's going to happen is anything that cannot go to the machine will go through this link here. And you can say, okay, so everything that goes above that, I can do something else with it or I can dispose that uh, to my block. But what the lab wants you to do is to count how many of those were discarded per process, right? So for that, you can add another counter saying here, well, this scar units. I'm defining that name in the counters block, and then I'm going to use another count block here, which is going to be named discard units. And if I run this now, it will let you know how many units were discarded that went through that because they were not able to stay in the queue because the queue has already two units in, in the system. The other thing that you need to know is how to compute the utilization of the machines. So the utilization of the machine, the easiest way to do that, and I think that's what I'm going to recommend for you to do now, is to go to the ROM setup and project parameters and click here on the statistic collection of the, of the resources. What that's going to do is going to give you the information about the, the statistical information about the machines. So if you go to run setup project parameters and then click resources and then click apply, you can run this again. And it will give you the machine utilization which here is 0 0.40 0 0.39% or 39% I'm sorry so that's saying that the machine is used or each machine is used 40% of the time the other rest the 60% the other 60% is idle And finally, there's a probability distribution here that might be kind of difficult for you to input, the one for the grinder. It says that it follows a discrete random variable defined, defined by 25% of, of the jobs taking six minutes. Then you have 50% taking 8 minutes and 25% requiring 12 minutes. So to input this information as a probability distribution in ARENA, you have to define what is called a discrete random variable. So that's going to be 
this probability distribution. You're going to open a parenthesis and you're going to start with the first one. So 0.25% requires six minutes. Then the next one is 50%. But the way this is defined is a cumulative distribution. So instead of putting 50% here, you're going to add 50% plus 25%. So this is going to be 0.75 takes 8. And then the rest, it should add to 1. So this 1 takes 12 minutes. Okay, so by inputting this into the processing time, you are representing this. Any questions? So that should cover all the things that you need to use to, to work on this lab. Again, how many jobs is a counter for 40 hours? the utilization, you use the report, you use the report, you check that resource um, option and it should give you the utilization for each one of the machines and the number of jobs ejected you have to use a counter for each one of the queues for each one of the resources just like we did here for this first key. So, these units that are coming here are the ones that you need to report for each one of the machines in the exercise. And I think it's, that's all you need. So again, uh, I'll let you work on this until Tuesday. If you have questions, you can send me an email and I will reply to you by email. Or if you want to meet um, with me, on Monday, we, we can do that as well. Um, but uh, I'll let you work on this. And if you have, let, let me know if you have any questions. So I have for today. So uh, I'll see you on Tuesday. Okay. See.